Gentlemen, he is the one, the only, he needs no introduction from me, Mr. Stephen Fry. <laughs> And may I say, what a spectacular walk-on. <laughs> Years of practice. Um, Do you know, I, well, this is obviously not going to go out in the show, but it's a strange thing about you, Jonathan. You know, when you started, you were a little young, well, barrow boy from wherever you come from. <laughs> <laughs> you had enormous charm, yeah. um, but you weren't a comedian. And I don't know, do we date it from, uh, they think it's all over, when you, you start and you took over from Lee Hurst, suddenly you, you explode in a riot of efflorescent verbiage of the most ghastly colour. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, it's, it's wonderful and admirable because you have a very quick mind in that sappy native cockney way and it's charming. <laughs> It's, see, it's I don't know whether this is nice or not. I, <laughs> I'm going up and down. It's like a roller coaster. It, it seems to be nice. No. Then it's not. Oh. Then it's nice again. Yes, but you, you, you have... You're toying with me, Fry. Yes, I am. Yes, yes. <laughs> but you've reinvented yourself. I've sort of had, but it wasn't deliberate. Deli it, it, whether deliberate or not, it's quite brilliant. It's quite well, God brilliant. bless you. It's very yeah. kind of you to say so. Happy. Happy to see an old man come back again. And... <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, Stephen, you've just been in, in Cannes. I know this for a fact. Mm. An enjoyable experience for you? It's extraordinary. I'm, I'm sure you've been many times to the Cannes Film Festival, and it is a, a remarkable Babylonian orgy. Quite, um, <laughs> quite. Ex we've never seen so many parties everywhere, and such desperation. And if there is one thing the French are quite manically suited to, it's to being security guards, uh, bouncers. <laughs> Every aspect of their rudeness, their logic, their cynicism, their, you know, all those qualities that we so admire in our Gallic cousins, they, they you know, they, you know, you, you, you assume that, you know, that a, a big East End bruiser is, is the expert at putting the palm in the, in the face yeah. like that. But that, until you've seen a Frenchman do it, the contempt, the, I mean, it's just extraordinary. And you see people who, who for whom the, the, all the waiters of the Ivy um, bow and scrape, you see them being kicked out like that. Do you remember that TV comic where the fans who used to get kicked out of cinemas when <laughs> trying to get autographs? These senior producers. It's, it's a very scavengy, mean place, but essentially it's a marketplace. As you know, people go there to sell films, and it's no different to a double glazing convention in, in Frankfurt. It really isn't. I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, every year, double glazing people go to Frankfurt, and they talk about whether or not they can get the South American sales for their double glazing, and someone comes up with a new double glazing product, and you kind of latch, or a new kind of gap between the two bits of grazing um, <laughs> and they sell it on and they talk and that's exact, exactly what it is with the films I mean the only difference is, is obviously you don't get Leonardo DiCaprio and Cameron Diaz at, at, at the average although if Frankfurt. you saw the film The Beach he probably will be selling double grazing <laughs> <laughs> so you're out in Cannes uh, and you're right it is a marketplace essentially mm. people go there to, to buy and sell films to try and hawk their new product mm. you, you have a film which finally I guess you, you're on the verge of making is that right Directly? yes yes we're going to go into um, uh, pre-production uh, in, in a couple of weeks it's a uh, an adaptation of Evelyn Moore's second novel Vile Bodies which I've retitled Bright Young Things um, it's it's an extraordinary um, it's Drugs and speed and parties and music and nightclubbing and celebrity and press. It's the first really modern novel of its kind. You could describe it to some extent if you wanted to be cheap, and I think we do, uh, as, um, <laughs> as, as England's great Gatsby. It is a the great jazz age novel. But and it was written when, about 28, 1928? 1928, right, yeah. spot on, yeah. And, uh, but he set it in the future rather, <laughs> rather strangely. Um, but it is, um, it, is the, it is the novel that uh, really describes this young, aimless generation who, who have nothing to, not, well, I say nothing to do. They're addicted to everything, addicted to parties, to nightclubs, to speed in every sense of the word, um, you know, whether it's motor racing. The music actually is extraordinary, the music of the time. I don't, uh, uh, you know, some of the fastest, you know, UK two-step garage music, as I believe it's called. <laughs> You're directing this as well as adapting it? I'm directing it, yeah. Is this yeah. the first time you've, you've adapted it? The first time I've, I've directed it, yes. Yeah. Well, that's, so it's a big challenge. It is, it is. I mean, the directors, they're just, um, you know, they're strange people. If you, as an actor, you only really see directors, obviously, on, on a film set, um, uh, which is a third of their life. A film is divided into roughly three parts. The pre-production, um, which can take three, three months. Um, which includes obviously casting and, and scouting or wrecking, as we say, for, for locations yeah. and, and all the planning that, that goes into the making of a film. Then there's the, what they call the principal photography, the, the bit where you're actually making it on the set and the actors are there. 
And then there's probably the longest period, which is the editing and, and dubbing, you know, the sound editing and so on. But I can great. sense uh, excitement uh, in you about approaching this new very, task. Very exciting. And so I assume this is what keeps you going, because you, you, you have enough money not to have to work, I assume. Is that what well, I, this I, is what I've, I've heard. I, I, don't know I, I, I have lavish tastes in, in Apple computers, amongst yeah. other things, and <laughs> prostitutes and so on. You know, it, 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 it mounts up. Uh, I went to bed with a rugby player. I mean, they, I never guessed they were a hooker. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It certainly oh. occurred to me, I'm sorry. Whoa. Um, oh, oh, there, we there we are. <laughs> it's nice, though. No, yes. Nice to see you coming down to my level. Well, no, I myself, I mean, dear Gussie, dear, dear Gussie Deaton, I mean, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a jolly good chap, and, and we all feel for him, obviously. Um, I, I've, been, um, I've been in trouble myself with, uh, with the press and with the police and with various, um, various arms of the establishment, and if I had known what pleasure it gives other people. It might have made me feel happy about it, because <laughs> every taxi driver for the last three or four days has just been beaming up. What about that Angus Deaton? <laughs> <laughs> The thing about Angus is because he is he's so capable and he's so much in control on the show, I think people like to see the chances for the grace because, of course, it, it's, you know, it's a chink in the armour. Yep, that's all it is, really. You know, and uh, right. uh, we actually do wish him well because it is you know, oh, it's gosh, most yes. unfortunate, but there you go, he is a f***ing idiot. <laughs> <laughs> The last word on the subject. Well, we do wish you well. Don't we? we do wish you well. We really do. Hey, you know the weird thing, uh, well, one of the strange things um, uh, I find about your career is, on the one hand, we know you as, you know, incredibly witty, insightful, informed, erudite, and, you know, hugely talented person, but also my children respond very well to you, not only in Blackadder, but they know you as the man who reads the Harry Potter books. That's uh, right, That's yes. what they know. They know you just as the Harry Potter man. Mm. And well, often I'll be putting my children to bed and I'll, I'll even say, can we have a tape on at bedtime? Say, and as I'll be walking downstairs, I'll hear you talking to them, which <laughs> took a bit of getting used to. <laughs> <laughs> I notice you do something that, see, when I read into the bedtime, there's always a bit where I start dozing off. <laughs> uh, how do you guard against that when you read? There's a bit where, and I'll start dozing off, and I don't know if you've done this, when you're reading a story to someone, you start dozing off. It's like the subconscious bubbles up. And obviously that's not something I want to inflict on anyone's children, especially mine. <laughs> but at one stage I did catch myself talking about tax returns. And I was saying, Dad, what's that got to do with Harry Potter? And I was half asleep. <laughs> what, now what actually happens is, oh, you're wearing earphones, if you fell asleep you, you wake yourself up with a bang on the microphone as you hit it. <laughs> but um, you, you just, you start to, the things start to swim in front of you and, and you... Uh, uh, the, the least, the most unlikely phrase becomes an absolute minefield. Um, I, there was one, Harry put it in his pocket, which is a pretty easy <laughs> thing to say. It's not a tongue twister. Well, it made know. me laugh. <laughs> yeah, but I couldn't say it. it uh, you know, I just went on, oh, Harry put it in his pocket. Harry put it in his pocket. I kept doing an extra syllable somewhere, I can't quite remember where. Harry put it in his pocket. And in the end, we had to stop it and just go back at the end of the day. Had to stop and get so. Alistair McGowan yeah. to do that line for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't claim to know you particularly well. I get the, uh, no. the feeling you're the sort of person who people don't get to know, only a few get to know you very well. Mm. Uh, only a few know you closely. And yet like you an ovary, it's only the first sperm that can actually get <laughs> through. The wall closes after that. And I'm still banging my head against That's the right. protective outer <laughs> shell. Um, <laughs> and yet, uh, you do seem to be very happy these days. I mean, you've always seemed fairly happy, but I get the feeling mm. you seem more content and more at ease with yourself than, than ever before. Yes, I, 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 I confess it, I think, um, which is a very difficult thing to do if you're British to say, yeah. <laughs> ha, ha. I can't say the word hap, hap, hap. It's very difficult, very embarrassing word to yeah. say. But no, I am I'm much more cheerful, much more, much more the thing. Love has shown me the way, John. So, because you have a partner now, is that right? I have a partner, yes. Well, congratulations, well, that's thank nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stop it. But you didn't have sex for like 16 years, did you? 15 and a half. That, yes. first, <laughs> that first time, you must have had to put blankets <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> and, did you call the fire brigade and warn them? Like, there, there, mm. there, there might be. Have you ever had an overmastering desire to throw a green baize cloth over him? Yeah. Like, yeah, like, yeah, like, like a parrot. Yeah, yeah, just woof like that. And time for bed. Yeah, it's uh, night time and then whoop, yeah. yeah. You know, I can't actually <laughs> help it. <does> it? <laughs> it's wonderful, though. It's, I'm more to be pitied than scorned. Yes, yes. Um, Stephen, thank it's you very much for coming on. I deeply appreciate it because I'm a, you know, you know I'm a fan of yours and I think just about everyone is. Uh, and if they're not, they, they should be taken out and roundly thrashed. <laughs> um, Stephen Fry, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you.